Chapman is joining us here on the show is Peter King. Peter, good morning. You're too kind, Damon. Thank you very much. Good morning. Yeah, my pleasure to have you here on the show. Thanks so much. And Patrick Mahomes is such an interesting character because he has accomplished so much in his young career, so much attention's on him, so many expectations are still on him to be one of the best ever. And yet, I don't get the feeling that celebrity has gone to Mahomes' head. Now, you got the chance to speak to him and kind of deep dive. What is it about his mentality that leads us to believe that this is kind of what we're going to get from Patrick Mahomes, no matter how much success he has? I think there's a couple of things in his toolbox right there, Damon. Number one, I think growing up the son of a major league baseball pitcher, who, looking at his record, he was in the big leagues for a long time, but he was not what you'd call a great pitcher, Pat Mahomes. He's a journeyman pitcher, got beat up some. Uh, and, and Patrick talked to me about this the other day, about how, you know, he learned from watching fan reaction to his father that, you know, it's not always going to be good. And so I think that's one of the things. He's used to the fact that, you're not going to please everybody. That's one thing. And I think the other thing is he's grown up in a time in America that uh, athletes, uh, this is not the Michael Jordan era where Republicans buy sneakers too. This is the time in America when you are black, you're, you basically, you, you are going to stand up for yourself. You're not just going to go to work and forget about it and put that away. And I think that's another part of him that, you know, famous quarterbacks have not been very politically active in in my career, in my 36 years covering the NFL. It's not one, two, it's almost everybody. I think he's going to break the mold there. And I guess the last thing I would say is that I think he understands that, you know, fame can be fleeting. And at some point after that, he's just not going to get too big for himself. Uh, I think had he wanted to, had he wanted to, Brett Veach, the Chiefs GM, told me this, you know, they could have driven a much harder bargain in negotiations with the Chiefs, he and his agent. Even though you say, my God, $472 million, whatever. I mean, that's a ridiculous amount of money. Yes, it is. But in about six years, his contract will probably be sixth or eighth or tenth in the NFL while he, I think you and I both agree that if we had one pick in the NFL right now, just one, to start a franchise with, we'd want to start with him, not just because of him as a player, but because of him as a person. Undoubtedly. And I spent years of my career in Kansas City, and so I know the Chiefs fan base intimately. I've got family and friends that are just incredibly dire, diehard Chiefs fans, and they all pinch themselves constantly saying, Is he really ours? Is he really ours? Because there's almost no way to look at him and criticize him. He just seems so perfect. And so when I saw $472 million, I said, boy, they really broke the bank. And then I saw people say, yeah, but it's actually kind of team friendly because he wanted to be surrounded by talent because he really wanted to win and he didn't want it to be about himself. Is that true? Could that much money actually still be team friendly? I mean, unless the economy absolutely craters and the salary cap stays in the one, you know, the high 100s instead of climbing as everybody thinks it will do. Um, you know, if I, I guess, I guess my, you know, my overarching feeling is he's got 12 years left, including the two current years on his deal. He's got 12 years left as a chief. And if you say that midway through this contract, he could be the 10th highest paid quarterback in football, realistically, it's not a, that's not a reach. But if the, if the salaries rise and the, and, the, and the cap keeps rising after this sort of this valley that they're in right now, I think it, it, it very well could be a team-friendly contract. And, you know, look, I told Veach the other day when I was talking to him about this that in a different way, it kind of reminds me of Tom Brady on a second contract in New England when he basically went to Scott Pioli, and, uh, who at the time was the uh, uh, de facto GM of the team, and said, listen, 
I, I'm not going to break the bank here. I'll sign for less. I just want you to guarantee, you know, I want your word that you're going to spend to the cap every year to try to get good players to surround me. That's, in essence, this year what Mahomes did. He allowed them to re-sign Chris Jones, really, because he wasn't a pig at the trough. Hmm. Peter King joins us this morning on the show, and he had a conversation with Patrick Mahomes as part of his podcast, the Peter King Podcast, wrote about it as well for Football Morning in America. So Chiefs fans and those that love Patrick Mahomes, definitely worth a listen and a read. Earl Thomas, released by the Ravens, is such an interesting story because he gets to Baltimore, supposedly adds one of those pieces as a veteran leader to get them to the Super Bowl, and yet the team basically votes him off the island. What went so (laughs) wrong in Baltimore? Yeah, what went so wrong in Baltimore for Earl Thomas? This is a classic case of a lot of little things were going wrong in Earl Thomas's year and three or four months with the team. And, you know, teams don't make an announcement in transactions, uh, you know, when they either find somebody or when they discipline somebody slightly, they keep it in-house. And so... In this particular case, Earl Thomas was late several times. He missed at least one walkthrough. Mike Silver reported the other day on NFL Network that uh, he was either late or missed one one day because he was getting his car washed. And uh, so he just is. And and look, I think that the fact is the mental errors that he was making on occasion on the practice field uh, this summer guys on that defense were saying this is a problem and he he's his attitude basically was don't worry about it and they said we're we're worried about it this is a problem and so you're absolutely right he got voted off the island the team didn't the teammates didn't want him no matter how good he was they didn't want him on the team or at least a lot of guys didn't and so i think that is one of the issues that confronted baltimore and good for them uh, that they realized it and they made the decision now. Hmm. What an interesting story. We just saw another safety get paid yesterday. Buda Baker for the Arizona Cardinals ends yeah. up becoming the highest paid safety in NFL history. And while he's been a great player for them, he has never had an interception. He's never <laughs> intercepted yeah. an NFL pass. What did you make of the Cardinals rewarding Baker so early in his career like that? I, well, you know, look, if you're going to sign a guy long term, it's be, and, you know, the guy basically, he's going to be coming up to renegotiate. You're eligible to do it now. I always say the earlier to do contracts, the earlier you, you do contracts, the better, uh, because price very rarely goes down. I might make an exception now at this era in history because, I mean, I think the cap could be one five each of the next two years. Um, you know, it's going to be that low next year, most likely. And so that's, that was a significant investment by the Cardinals. And I think the one other thing that it says is that safeties right now, one of the reasons that that contract, the biggest significance to that contract, in my opinion, Damon, is that it tells guys like Jamal Adams, we are valuing the safety position more in the NFL than we have in the past. And I believe this is going to result in maybe 16 million a year for Jamal Adams. Amazing. My final question is going to be about attendance at games because we have the Miami Dolphins that are willing to put maybe 13,000 people in the stands. And a lot of other teams have said, no, no attendance this year. And Sean McDermott kind of felt as though this was a competitive disadvantage for a team like his, that they'll have no fans. I wonder why the NFL would even want to open up this can of worms and have any fans in attendance when it's somewhat unnecessary financially for them. Is there an internal discussion, debate, argument over whether there should be fans allowed in any games this fall? Not that I had heard until uh, Sean McDermott raised it. I'm sure a lot of coaches don't like it. I disagree with Sean McDermott, and I disagree with you a little bit about, you know, this this aspect of, you know, you don't need to have fans at games. Um, you know, the NFL NFL teams probably, the best estimates that I've heard, are 
by not having fans, by not having in stadium revenue, by not having the parking, all that other stuff, uh, all the ancillary money, um, we'll probably lose somewhere between 60 and $90 million a team on average. And you say, well, you know, these guys are all rich. It's okay. They can afford it. Well, of course they can. But have you ever met a rich person who has the opportunity to make money and he turns it down? And, and, and also, it also affects what the salary cap is going to be. It's less revenue being brought in. And so I think for coaches, they don't care about that stuff. But if you're a player, you want to see fans in the stands because it means money, uh, ticket sales, all that stuff. Now, I do understand what McDermott is saying because it probably is a, a slight, slight competitive advantage for the teams that are going to have people in there. But, Damon, you know, honestly, I wrote this in May, and when I wrote it, one of the uh, – I actually got a call from an owner of all things. It really surprised me. I, I wrote that this is a year that's going to be wholly unfair, and it's going to be really – uh, there are going to be things that happen during the course of the year that you would never tolerate in any other year. And people should, in my opinion, this year should just say, hey, listen, just suck it up and go do it. You know, it's like Whit Merrifield of the Royals last week uh, when I was in Kansas City. I asked him if he had any advice for Mahomes and his buddies. He's a good buddy of Mahomes. He said to me, yeah, embrace the suck. That's the saying we have in our clubhouse. It's just, it's really not not fun the way it usually is when there's no fans and you can't go out to dinner on the road and things like this, it's just a totally different experience. Um, so I guess my whole thing with this would be take your battles, but having, you know, being angry about having fans at some games and not others seems to be a, a very, uh, not unimportant, but in this year, in my opinion, it's unimportant. Understood. I think my big thing is, does the NFL, is it worth financially the headache of needing to police everybody inside that stadium to make sure well, they're always another, wearing masks? Yeah, that's another issue. The other day, I saw a picture, and a lot, of, most of the fans, but the, the picture I saw at Kansas City at their scrimmage were not wearing masks. That's not tolerable. If you're not going to wear a mask, you should not go to the game. That's all there is to it. Now, you got you know, I don't even know if they're going to have food or what the deal is, but obviously you're going to have to take your mask off at some point. If you're just sitting there watching the game, you have to be told you wear a mask, you're not allowed in here. And in my opinion, that's the way the NFL has to go. Yeah, and they've got to police it pretty closely in the stands with everybody that's in there when they get up to the bathroom, when they get up to go to any line. They're really going to have to police this really closely. So that's going to be an interesting thing to watch this season for the teams that do have some fans in attendance. Peter King podcast features Patrick Mahomes this week, which is very cool. And his football morning in America column, which is always a must read for football fans tackles the chiefs trying to repeat also the Earl Thomas release as well. And what it means to not have preseason games and try to get ready for the regular season. That's all part of football morning in America. It's part of profootballtalk.com and NBC sports as well. Peter, it's always really tr tremendous to catch up with you and talk a little football. So thanks so much for doing it with us today. Can't wait till we can do it again. You're welcome, Damon. Call anytime. Take care.